This evening, the theme for this evening is forgiveness. And as I mentioned, it's very traditional in uh, many Buddhist countries to forgive before the New Year. The New Year is generally in April and not at the end uh, in December, like we have December 31st. And it's a very, in a very real way, it's a good opportunity to let go of the hurts from the previous year. And as I often say, with, uh, it's not always e easy to forgive. Uh, often the hardest person to forgive, ourselves, <laughs> let alone others. But in actual fact, it's, uh, it's very good mental hygiene. It's very good emotional hygiene if we can forgive because holding on to these things, of course, is not for our benefit, not for our happiness. It causes a lot of suffering and it brings up the past again and again. And particularly if it's some form of abuse, you know, whether it be physical abuse, and we're hearing a lot this year, aren't we, about sexual abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, all those things, very hard to let go of, but very much for our benefit if we can let go of them because they weigh us down, they make us miserable and they can make people around us miserable as well. And so Ajahn Brahm's formula, the AFL formula, which of course stands for the Australian Football League, <laughs> is very easy for people in Melbourne particularly to remember. And it's a very easy way, a, a very convenient reminder, practical reminder of accept, forgive and learn. And uh, sometimes, because Ajahn Brahm, you know, changes the wording from time to time, I remember the earlier, uh, earlier wording was acknowledge, forgive, let go. But all of them, they point to the same thing. Forgiveness, uh, forgiveness and is an emotion. It's an emotion. And it's an emotion of letting go. And it's something we can only do from wisdom, really. And also, I was going to mention too, another teacher, one of my teachers, she also used a similar, uh, similar theme too, for particularly uh, in terms of forgiving ourselves, letting go of things that we have done and said, and even thought. And this is Aya Kima, and she said, acknowledge no blame, either ourselves or anybody else for that matter, and then change. And so that's, that's a very worthwhile formula too. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, give, first of all, the angle that the Buddha uh, encouraged in terms of uh, forgiveness, in terms of how to deal with, you know, uh, uh, abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse. And I was going to read, first of all, the simile of the sword, just a little bit from the simile of the sword. People know this, but it's a fantastic teaching. <laughs> it's a very hard teaching in some ways. So I'll just read, uh, I'll read that, because it's lovely, I think. Monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw, he who gave rise, or she who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teachings. Herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them, that person, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monks. Now, first of all, I'd say, anybody here could do that? <laughs> could you, if someone was sawing your limbs off savagely, not just nicely, uh, could you not have a mind of, of hate, a mind of ill will? It would be very, very difficult. Only, only people that could do this really would be an arahant, or we say, this is a fully enlightened person, or somebody who is the second, uh, the, the second last stage of enlightenment, an anagami, because they have no ill will is gone. There's nothing in there for them to react. But this is, the Buddha makes the point though at the end of this sutta, which is very, very useful actually, because to, that standard is very hard for us to achieve. But what he's actually aiming at by giving this very extreme simile, he's very good at this. I mean, you hear this, people soaring limbs off and so on. Can you forget it? I doubt it. <laughs> it stands, stays in the mind. 
And then the, the Buddha concludes by saying, monks, if you keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech, trivial or gross, that you could not endure? No, venerable sir. Therefore, monks, you should keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So that's a very extreme example, isn't it? But I wanted to, because in the end, you know, the, when we hear, you know, about forgiveness and we talk about forgiveness, it's not as powerful as when we actually uh, come across lived examples, somebody who's forgiven the totally unacceptable. And that was one of the things I wanted to uh, use this evening because I think when you hear this story, you know, it's a real, real story, true life, the person's still alive, then you may think, like the simile of the saw, wow, if she can forgive that, <laughs> I can forgive whatever, you know. Because this is, uh, concerns a, a woman who's called uh, Eva Kaur. Do people know of Eva Kaur? Have you heard of her? I think she's quite well known now, yes. You've heard about her? Oh, that's pretty good. You've heard her name. She's uh, amazing because she and her identical sister, uh, they were Jewish, uh, Jewish children in Romania. And when the Nazis came to power in Germany, and uh, the Romanians, uh, Romanian government uh, allied themselves with the Nazis. They were uh, rounded up and put into a ghetto in, I think, January 1944. And in May 1944, they were sent to Auschwitz, to the concentration camp. So her mother, father, two older sisters, and uh, herself and her identical sister, Miriam, all went to Auschwitz. And when they got there, it was a very difficult journey, they got there, they were sorted out. And uh, the, most of them were sent to the left, no, to the right, I think it was, to the gas chambers. But uh, the uh, soldiers that were sorting them out were yelling in German, twins, twins, twins. And they came and asked uh, Eva's mother, is, is you, uh, is the, are they twins, these two girls? And she said, yes. And then she said, it was very heart-wrenching, they, they tore the children away, the two girls away from the mother. Mother went to the, to the gas chambers and the two children, they were saved. They went for medical experiments. So they were, you know, being used as guinea pigs by Dr. Joseph Mengel. So this is amazing, it's just incredible. And um, what, what their regime was in this uh, concentration camp was Three days a week, they were injected, both of them were injected with uh, five injections, uh, I think three times a day on those three days. And then the other three days, they were naked <laughs> and, and were examined by doctors. All these twins were together being examined by doctors because they wanted to compare uh, the various experiments, these, these injections. And after one of these injections, uh, Eva, uh, there were the two sisters, Eva and Miriam, and Eva got very, very sick and developed this incredible fever. And uh, she thought she was going to die. And even uh, Dr. Joseph Mengel, the, uh, the uh, what they call the angel of death, <laughs> came and he said, yeah, she'll be dead within two weeks. But she had this, in, you can tell, she's a very strong person. She realized if she died, they would kill her sister. So there'd be no longer, there'd be a twins. There wouldn't be twins to experiment. So she had this determination to hold on and she managed to hold on and survive, which was in pretty, uh, pretty incredible actually that she did do that. And then after eight months in the concentration camp in January, the Russians, uh, the Russians came and liberated Auschwitz. This is in Poland. But, she was an amazing character because in the 80s she started a museum in, I think it's in America actually, called Candles, where all the survivors of the, well, a museum dedicated to the people that were experimented on in Auschwitz because she was part of it and the whole museum was about that. And she was often asked to talk about the experience of the Holocaust and in the 90s, 
um, her sister passed away after, you know, some of the experiments were very, very tough on the body. And in 1995, for the 50th anniversary of the uh, liberation of Auschwitz, she did an amazing thing. She wrote an amnesty for the Nazis, an amnesty for the Nazis. And also she wanted uh, someone, one of the uh, German doctors that was there in Auschwitz to sign that amnesty, to prove that this did happen. Because at that time, you may remember, people were saying, there were people saying, oh, the, uh, the Holocaust in, didn't happen. And so this was very important. And so she enlisted the help of a, a German doctor, Dr. Munch, who was in the concentration camps, but it was evidently one of the more um, kind, kind people there. And he didn't, he didn't participate in some of the, uh, the atrocities there. And so she, uh, she had this association with him and they had this 50th anniversary and they signed the amnesty. And then after that, it came to her mind, you know, she said, I wanted to thank this Nazi doctor. Um, I didn't know how to thank a Nazi, she recalls in the video. After 10 months, one morning I awoke, I woke up and the following simple idea popped into my head. How about a letter of forgiveness from me, from me to Dr. Munch? I knew immediately he would like that and that it was a meaningful gift. But what I discovered for myself was life-changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power and no one could take it away from me. It was all mine to use in any way I wished. And that, that was a, a liberating uh, insight for her, actually. She said up to that point she had been, she felt like a victim, you know, powerless, helpless. But when she discovered that, uh, she was freed, freed from it. Cool. And she also said another nice quote from his, why survive at all if you want to be sad, angry and hurting? She says, that is, so foreign to, that is so foreign to who I am. I understand why the world, is, I don't understand why the world is so much more willing to accept lashing out in anger rather than embracing friendship and humanity. And of course she's, uh, not only uh, did she write that letter and uh, forgive Dr. Munch, which uh, it was very controversial because many of the people who went through the Holocaust too could not accept that, you know, that they, they weren't ready to forgive. And so they felt her forgiveness was almost a betrayal. And very, very interestingly for me, she's married. Her husband was a Holocaust survivor too. And he is not willing to uh, forgive. He's not ready for it. And so she, she also said that uh, about this act of forgiveness, she forgave um, not only Dr. Munch, and there, um, there are scenes of them embracing. She also had a, the recently, in 2015, there was a trial of a 93-year-old former Nazi who uh, was uh, in court, and she gave, forgave him as well. And there's a touching photo of that at the same time. But she says, this forgiveness is an act of self-healing, self-liberation and self-empowerment. We cannot change what happened, but we can change how we relate to it. Isn't that so true? <laughs> Very important. And then she said, I forgave the Nazis not because they deserve it, but because I deserve it. Isn't that very good? And that's so, that's so true. We hold on to this stuff and we don't realize that we deserve to be free of it. And interestingly enough, she said, uh, the day I forgave the Nazis, privately I forgave my parents, whom I hated all my life for having not saved me from Auschwitz. She says, children expect their parents to protect them. Mine couldn't. So of course, you know. And then I forgave myself for hating my parents. So it, was, it brought a lot of healing for her, you know. And uh, for those who wish to see more of that, of course, YouTube, 
You put in Eva Kaur, K-O-R, you can see a few videos, and she's very inspiring in those videos. But of course, you know, having read a little bit about it, I realise it's not as simple as that. She is forgiven, and for her, that's wonderful. But many of the other survivors, not ready to forgive. That's, that's quite interesting. So it's very powerful. When you hear somebody like that forgive, what could we forgive that? I mean, that's, uh, that would be very tough for all of us. But somebody who went through that could forgive that and could liberate themselves from that. So just to briefly talk about the first stage of acceptance. You know, this is AFL, acceptance or acknowledgement. You know, when we accept things. This is actually, for all of us, you know, when we accept something, it's easy to forgive. It starts a process. Acceptance leads to forgiveness, we can forgive, and then we can learn from it or we can let go. The whole process of acceptance, forgiving, and learning or letting go is a letting go process, one that comes from wisdom. And of course, we have to know clearly what happened, we have to ex acknowledge that it happened, and accept that what's happened we cannot change, just as Eva, <laughs> Eva said about uh, the concentration camps. And of course, some of the best ways to develop that sort of acceptance, very important part of, uh, of, of these emotions, is emotions like loving kindness, compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. Because they have a lot of acceptance in them, and that ability to let go, which is so important for forgiveness. Because when we know all beings, what they are striving for is the same as what we are striving for. They want to be happy. They want to be uh, happy. They want to be at peace. They want to be well. And when we know, you know, that all beings, they don't want to suffer. This is compassion. It's this sort of understanding can help us let go of some of the hurts that we have. And of course, some of the best ways, a very strong way the Buddha recommended for letting go of things especially these grudges that we can have. Is, and he mentions this in the Dhammapada. He says, there are those who do not realize that one day we all must die. That's true. But those who realize this settle their quarrels. This is not only uh, quarrels, but it's also forgiveness. So this is a uh, part of that understanding, because it's only wisdom that will actually allow us to let go. Then the mind will let go the emotions, these ne negative emotions of hurt, negativity, then can uh, let go. And of course, another important aspect of this is to realize that, you know, am I perfect? <laughs> if I'm perfect, then in that case, I'm, I can justify it in hanging on to my grudge, uh, the negativity that I feel towards this other person or this situation in my life. But of course, when we realize that no, we're not perfect, so we can forgive imperfection in others. And this is this is actually quite useful for us. I know uh, another thing that Ajahn Brahm often uh, uh, mentions too is that we can think of somebody as being being sick. If you think someone's got cancer, and you're angry and upset with them when you hear they've got cancer, you think, oh, <laughs> you, you don't feel so negative, and you can. It's easier to let go. Because it brings us back to that recollection of death, you know, this person's only got limited time. But most importantly with forgiveness, and I, I asked it for myself too, is how do I feel when I don't forgive? How do I feel when I hang on to this negativity? Uh, I, know, I know for most people it feels dreadful actually, it feels really awful. So. We can very much ask ourselves, you know, why am I hanging on to this? This is hurting me. <laughs> Who, heaven knows if the other person is, is, is suffering, that one can't tell. But certainly holding on to grudges, often liken it to, you know, holding on to a, a very smelly, grubby rubbish bin, full of rubbish. And these things that we're holding on to are rubbish and they hurt us. They, they, uh, they're very painful and unpleasant. So my, my, always, I feel for myself too, and I hear Ajahn Brahm say this too, is let's empty the bin <laughs> if best we can, when we're, as much as we can, what we're ready for, 
You know, this is a, you have to be at the right time. And as I say, it's only wisdom that will allow you to let go. So for those people in the concentration camp that were in those medical experience, uh, experiments and so on, they're not, some of them not ready to let go. And for them, they could not forgive. But a very important part of uh, the reason we can't forgive sometimes is this sense of being right. We were right, you know, they did something bad, they said something bad to us. And, and we're justified in, in being angry, not forgiving them, not forgetting uh, that what they've done. And this is, of course, uh, what keeps it going in a very real sense. And I saw a nice saying on the internet which said, holding on to grudges doesn't make us strong, it only makes us bitter. Forgiving doesn't make us weak, it sets us free. And that's, I think that's wisdom. You hear that and you say, yes, <laughs> that's for sure. So that, as I say, one has to be ready for forgiving and have the, the wisdom that goes with it. And so these are some things. And we can also, you know, one thing that is very helpful for accepting um, uh, negative things in ourselves and others is just to realize that we're conditioned. The conditions in the past, the situations we're in the past, led us to be like we are, led other people to be like they are. And so we can sort of forgive and let go a lot easier when we see that, that they're just products of their conditioning, just as we are. So forgiveness, uh, the actual for, forgiving, uh, forgiving ourselves and others. I often like, um, in, in, uh, in Buddhist countries particularly, we often chant, you know, asking forgiveness from the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. And that can be very useful actually, uh, can be quite powerful for us. Because we know, for instance, uh, the uh, Buddha, you might know the story of Venerable Devadatta, Devadatta, the cousin of the Buddha, who tried to kill the Buddha on a number of occasions and uh, by rolling stones, uh, by getting an elephant drunk, Nalagiri, and having it charge the Buddha. And there's a number of occasions that we hear of. But the Buddha is actually quoted as saying that he had as much metta, loving kindness, for Devadatta, the person who was trying to kill him, as he had for Venerable Ananda, who was his attendant for many, many years. And so you can see that sort of incredible um, evenness, unconditional, unconditioned uh, loving kindness that doesn't distinguish between people. And of course, it's what we aim for as well. Uh, so asking forgiveness of the Buddha is a very good way of doing it. And of course, f formally asking forgiveness from uh, uh, other people, ourselves and other people, is also useful. So one formula that I like is when we're asking forgiveness, please forgive me for anything I did or said or failed to do or say, that's quite important, that hurt you or upset you, whether I did them intentionally or unintentionally. And then the other thing, of course, the other half of it, ideally, is giving forgiveness. We can ask for forgiveness and we give forgiveness. I forgive you for anything you did or said or failed to do or say that hurt me or upset me, whether you did them intentionally or unintentionally. And we have a very similar process in the, the monk's discipline, the nun's discipline, of making amends where we acknowledge something as a um, uh, breaking one of our rules, we ask for forgiveness, and then we make amends. And this is a very important part. We determine not to do it again, and that's, that's important. So what do we learn or let go? What do we learn when we let go? What do we learn when we forgive? I think, first of all, we feel much better, <laughs> much better, lighter, happier, less burdened and healthier. And what's more, when we forgive, when we learn to forgive, it becomes quicker and easier. And it becomes more of a habit that we can do. 
And some people actually like to practice forgiveness at the end of every day because there's, <laughs> there's always a backlog of things that can come up. And certainly if we do, we will be able to let go of things very, very much, much, much easier. But one of the important points too, and Ajahn Brahm calls it positive forgiveness, is addressing the causes, the sources of the, prob the original problem. Because sometimes good to forgive, it is always good to forgive, but if we don't address those causes and pro uh, those sources of the problem, then the problem can come up again and again. So that is a, that's using wisdom again. So that's the AFL. Accept, acknowledge, or we could say acknowledge, forgive, and learn or let go. So hopefully, keeping in mind Eva Kaur and her example, I think, you know, when I, I listen to her example, when you see the videos, if you see the video, it's really, poor, really strong. You, I, I feel I could let go of anything. <laughs> Nothing in, that I have experienced, one of the hurts I experienced, nearly as tough as what she has been able to let go of. But of course, we all have to be ready for that and take it in our own, own good time. And to the degree that we've developed the wisdom, the understanding that allows us to let, it, let go. Because letting go always comes from wisdom. When the mind understands something, it can let go. We can't force it. But when we have the, the appropriate wisdom, the appropriate understanding, it will happen very naturally. So I'd like to finish uh, the uh, talk there. There are other um, very interesting uh, uh, videos and so on on YouTube that are well worth watching too. I saw one on a Chinese mother whose son was killed by her best friend and she publicly uh, forgave uh, her son's murderer. And uh, it's very touching, a very touching video. It's in China and um, evidently swept China. Uh, it went viral in China, which is a good thing to, to have this, these qualities of forgiveness. To see somebody who can forgive something is really difficult, <laughs> really difficult. So in this, uh, for the year, for the end of this year, I hope you can forgive uh, as much as you can forgive of the, of the past year, of the past hurts, to start the new year with less luggage, <laughs> less baggage.